Good morning to everyone. Um, happy to continue uh, today. Uh, Shota will now give us the third talk about correlation function in n equal to 4 and integrability. Okay, so uh, let's start slowly because this is the first lecture in the morning. So I actually realized that I forgot to uh, thank the organizer, so let me use this opportunity to thank the organizer to giving me opportunity to uh, talk about what I'm, more, what I'm excited about. And also this is the second time that I came to CERN and the uh, last time was actually uh, several years ago. And at that time I was actually participating in this school, but as a PhD student and as a participant, so it's a bit kind of weird for me that now I'm standing on this side and pretending that I know a lot more than you, but <laughs> although we, the truth is not, um, but I'm going to try my best. Okay, so let me start slowly. Uh, so let me first review what we did in the previous two lectures. So in the first lecture, uh, we discussed uh, how to determine the S matrix of O and sigma model by assuming the integrability. And the result is like this, and uh, there is an overall factor, and, and also there are several tensor structures, which is consistent with the O and symmetry, and these uh, tensor structures and relative coefficients are determined by Jan Baxter equation and the crossing equation, crossing symmetry. And the overall factor, you can also determine it by unitarity, by imposing unitarity of the S matrix, and the crossing symmetry. In, this, in the second lecture, uh, we, uh, we learned how to, well, how the spin chain arises, especially integrable spin chain arises from n equals four super mu theory. And essentially, the point is that if you consider what's called single trace operator, then you can map it to the spin chain. And then the anomalous dimension of the operator uh, at one loop is mapped to the so-called energy of the Heisenberg spin chain, where the energy of the state here of, of the Heisenberg spin chain is given by the sum of the energy of the individual magnons, and the momenta of the magnons are constrained by the so-called beta equations. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, how to kind of combine these idea and solve the n equals four super mu theory, especially the spectrum of n equals four super mu theory at finite coupling. And so the key words of today's lecture is these two. So actually I came earlier than usual just to prepare this. So, <laughs> so there are two important uh, keywords here today. So one is little group, uh, which you also heard from Freddie, I guess. And another is large gauge transformation. Uh, if I want to uh, phrase it in a fancy way, I could also say it's a kind of asymptotic symmetry. And in my story, it's also re related to the central extension of the symmetry. But yeah, I, I will describe, describe why these are relevant uh, for this story. Okay, now, now I need to get that blackboard back. Great. Okay, so, so, so I'm going to talk about the spectrum of inequals for super misery. So last, last time we dis only discussed the one loop spectrum, one loop anomalous dimension of the inequals for super misery. But of course, uh, there are, you can, the next question you can ask is what happens uh, at higher loops? And people actually did study that, and it turned out also at higher loop, especially two loop and three loops, uh, these, if you really do the Feynman diagram computation and then uh, compute the anomalous dimension or the mixing, well, or the divergent part of the correlation function and, and read off the matrix which governs the anomalous dimension, then it turns out, so these at high two and three loops, they correspond to some new integrable spin chain. And, but of course, it's hard to continue, hard to do higher loops, even higher loops, because 
anyway, in the beginning, we need to do the Feynman diagram computation, and it becomes much, much harder if you go to higher loops. And another question you can ask is that, oh, okay, so yes, yesterday, the day before yesterday, I only considered like a, this kind of operators, but in n equals four super mu theory, you can have various uh, different kinds of fields. So you can try to insert those fields inside the trace. So instead of y's, I can insert something like uh, covariant derivatives, where alpha and alpha, alpha dot are is the usual spinner indices. Or I can also insert fermions, or I can insert some different scalars like this. And you can ask the question whether the integrability is preserved, even if you add, diff if you allow different scalars or different uh, insertions. And it turns out at one loop, you can clearly sh see that even if you consider these uh, generalized operators, uh, it actually maps to the spin chain, and which is a kind of fancy version of Heisenberg spin chain, which is called PSU2 2 slash 4 spin chain. But again, doing the higher loop is hard. And in order to understand the higher loop, okay, in order to understand the higher loop, uh, we need a kind of new ideas. And the idea I'm going to employ in this lecture is to use the symmetry. And especially, well, I said n equals four super mu theory is a super conformal field theory, so I use super conformal field symmetry. And in addition, we make, I make use of the gauge symmetry. I will explain later what I mean by this. And also, uh, to some extent, I also assume the integrability persists even at higher loops. And then you can ask, what can we learn about the spectrum if you assume the integrability? So the approach is very similar to the, o, uh, to the one we discussed for the ON model. Okay, so let me start by discussing the symmetry. Uh, okay, so let me see. Maybe I should first erase. Okay, so, so let me first just start by discussing the symmetry. <laughs> discussing the symmetry. Uh, one. Symmetry constraints for two point functions. So, to discuss the symmetry, uh, let me go back to the textbook example in which you can kind of efficiently use the symmetry. So the textbook example I would like to discuss now is uh, the classification of the particles using the Poincaré group symmetry. So this is a this is something you learn I guess when you start, started to learn quantum field theory. And let me remind you what are the necessary steps for doing that. So the step one, uh, so, the, so what I'm going to do is to classify the particles like a spinners or vectors using the Poincaré group. And the step one is to go to the rest frame. So. So in general, particle has uh, momentum k mu, but in order to classify the particle, it's better to go to the rest frame where the uh, four 
dimensional momentum is like m0000. And the step two is to find the little group. So what is the little group? So little group is precisely the a subgroup of the Poincaré group, which preserves this vector. Or otherwise, in other words, it's uh, basically the stabilizer of that vector. And the step three is just to uh, use the representation theory of the little group to classify the particles. So step three uh, representation theory of little group to, to classify or constrain, uh, I would say, internal motion with quotation mark. So by which I mean like spin or helicity. OK. Yeah, it's actually hard to see. So, and what I'm going to do next is to apply these ideas to n equals four super mu theory, and in particular the two point function of n equals four super mu theory. So let me do that. Okay. Okay, so let me do that. So n equals four super mu theory and two point function. So, so as I said, the step one is to find the rest frame. Of course, it's not so obvious what is the analog of the rest frame for n equals four super mu theory, especially the two-point function of n equals four super mu theory. But I would claim that the considering the analog of considering the rest frame is considering this two-point function, where uh, the operator one is made up of just z. Remember, z is just a complex scalar field, and now I have complex conjugate inserted at infinity. And for those who know about the spectra, uh, supersymmetry of n equals four super mu theory, this is actually half VPS operator. So I would claim this is the, uh, uh, this is the rest frame. Of course, this is not the most general two-point function that I want to understand. But the idea is to first go to this fr rest frame and then later add some some analog of internal motion to describe more general operators. So this is the rest frame. And now I can ask what is the little group? And as I said, the little group is the stabilizer of the rest frame, which preserves the configuration of the rest frame. So you can ask uh, what is the part of the symmetry uh, of superconformal group in n equals four super mu theory, which preserve these two point functions. And it turns out uh, the little group is what's called PSU two slash two squared. So it has two, it, uh, it is a kind of product of two groups, and one is PSU two slash two, and the other is also PSU two slash two. So let's call it left and right. And let's see. So let's first understand the bosonic subgroup, subgroup of this little group. So the bosonic subgroup, so because you have SU2 here and SU2 here, so you have SU2 squared, which is SO4, SU2 squared. 
And also, we, you have SU2 here and SU2 here. So you have SO4 again. And this first SO4 is very easy to see. Because we have operator at 0 and operator at infinity, so rotation around this point clearly preserves this configuration. So this SO4 is actually uh, rotation, so the space-time rotation. So what is the other SO4? And the other SO4 is also easy to understand. So if you look at this correlation function, I'm only using uh, the two of four, uh, sorry, two of six scalar fields. So remember, n equals four super has six scalars, but I'm only using two of them. So it's, then it's clear that uh, there is a SO4 subgroup of our symmetry, which basically rotate phi three to phi six. Three, four, five, six, that, so it, that's SO4. So, and in addition to that, there are several uh, uh, supersymmetries. Okay, let me just uh, write it explicitly. Well, so these rotation, I would write later denote it like L alpha beta, and this is AB. So, okay, so because there are two structure, I have like two different rotations. So these are basically spinner indices. And this generator belongs to left part of PSU2 slash 2, and this generator belongs to right part. And similarly, uh, I have two sets of the R symmetry generator. Uh, and so alpha and betas runs from 1 to 2. and a and B also runs from one to two. So this is essentially SU2 notation of, uh, well, okay, so, so here I'm just decomposing SO4, each SO4 into SU2 times SU2, and these are generators of S SU2. And in, a, in addition to these bosonic symmetries, uh, there are also uh, supersymmetry and superconformal symmetries. So here again, alpha runs from one to two, and A runs from one to two. So this is the fermionic part, and plus dotted version. Okay, is this clear? So these uh, generators belongs to PSU two slash two left, and there is also analogous uh, generators which belong to the SU2 slash to right. Okay, so this is supersymmetry and this is superconformal. Now, so is there any question so far? Well, you can ask me any questions. So, so now we discussed the little group. So the next step is to uh, classify the internal motion using this little group. But before doing that, I first need to explain what is the internal motion in this case. Well, actually, I already give you a kind of answer. But let me nevertheless explain it again explicitly. So step three is to classify the internal motion. So here, the analog of the internal motion, so, so far we only consider the field made up of, sorry, the operator made up of Zs. And, the, and now I would like to kind of excite this operator so that it has some internal motion. And I'm going to say, I'm going to claim that uh, the analog of, oops, giving the internal motion is inserting some other fields of n equals 4 super For example, 
the covariant derivatives, or some scalar field, or some fermions. And, and the question we need to ask is, can we classify this internal motion, or especially more explicitly, can we classify these insertions of different fields using the little group? And, and it turns out uh, you can, of course, do that. And, and the answer is as follows. So the answer turns out that uh, these internal motion or these individual field uh, belong to bifundamental representation. of PSU 2 slash 2 squared, which I just described over there. So you have two PSU 2 slash 2 factor, and each uh, object, each insertion contains like a one fundamental uh, represent representation uh, label for uh, left PSU 2 slash 2, and one fundamental representation label for the right PSU 2 slash 2. That's the structure. So let me, uh, uh, let me, explain a little bit more about it. So in general, so this is a, so the bifundamental representation of PSU 2 slash 2 contains two legs or two labels, and each label corresponds to each PSU 2 slash 2. So here, this corresponds to PSU 2 slash 2 left label, and the other corresponds to PSU 2 slash 2 right label. And each indices A takes four value, and let's call it in this, let's write it in this way. So, so the first two is bosonic index. Uh, let's see, yeah, the first two is bosonic index. And well, let's see what is good. Okay, so let's, let's choose a different convention. The first two is fermionic index, and the last two is bosonic index. And, okay, let me <laughs> explain what, uh, what is precise map with this expression and that expression. So, so the relation is as follows. So as I said, like uh, each A and A dot contains, well, four labels. And what happens is that uh, if you take A, for example, one, one dot, then that's the, that corresponds to essentially uh, covariant derivative in the spinner representation. So it, that corresponds to inserting DZ inside Z. On the other hand, and the same is true, as long as uh, the two indices are taken from the first two, and so this one also corresponds to one, two, dot Z. And let me remind you that this notation basically comes from the fact you can contract the covariant derivative with the Pauli matrix, and then it becomes, it starts having uh, the spinner indices because of the Pauli matrix. And on the other hand, if two indices are taken from, uh, the, three, from the latter two, the three and four, then it actually corresponds to uh, some scalar insertion. So three, four dot is, for example, y. And x is phi three plus Sorry, x is phi five plus i phi six, and y is phi three plus i phi four. So this is the mapping. And in addition to these guys, of course, I can kind of use, a, I can choose a more general like a combination of the indices. For example, I can choose one and for a and three for a dot. And if you choose the indices in that way, for example, one, three dot, or one, four dot, or two, three dot, et cetera. These corresponds to uh, fermions. So to summarize, if you 
take two, in, two fermionic indices, then it corresponds to covariant derivative. If you, take, if you choose two bosonic indices, then it corresponds to uh, scalar, whereas if you choose one fermionic and one bosonic, then it corresponds to fermion. So this is how you classify the internal motion. And in the rest of my talk, because it has the product group structure, I would rather express it as really like a product. So this is a bit like a meson notation, whereas this is like quark notation. And chi A takes four values. And as I said, the first two is fermions. And the, the latter two is boson. Now I'm using a different convention a little bit. So this is actually one, two, and three, four in the previous notation. But I just wanted to make, clear, make it clear that the first two corresponds to fermions and the latter two corresponds to boson. And once I do that, then I don't need to uh, call it three and four. I would rather prefer to call it one and two so because I already, have, uh, I already have the symbol that tells you that this is bosonic index. So this is just a convention. So uh, now I classify the internal motion using the little group. And so now we know that uh, uh, this is the group which classifies, well, which allows you to classify the, or the constraint the two-point function. But uh, this is unfortunately not very powerful. So this gives you some constraint. So use it if, even if you use a little group, but not much. In particular, uh, the problem here is that, OK, so we only talked about the global symmetry. And if, if you just impose uh, the invariance of, under this little group, uh, there is no way to know the coupling constant dependence. But But the object we need to understand, of course, depend on, depends non-trivially on the coupling constant, because what I'm going to do today is to solve n equals four supermusery at finite couplings. And then you need to come up with a little bit better method or a better idea how to incorporate the coupling constant dependence. So that's the next topic. Okay, so let's see. Uh, maybe I should first erase. Okay. So any questions so far? Yeah, maybe it's a bit complicated, but even if you don't understand all the detail, but I think it's probably enough to understand the basic idea. Maybe the basic idea can be used for in different contexts. So anyhow. Okay, so, so as I said, uh, this gives you some constraint, but not very much because that little group I just described doesn't know anything about the coupling constant dependence. And the key idea to incorporate the coupling constant dependence is to consider an infinitely long operator. and forget trace. So what I mean here by considering infinitely long operator is that uh, so you have some z's and with some insertions. And, but the idea is like uh, put as many fields as, well, put infinitely many fields inside the trace. Then effectively, you can basically forget about the fact that it's actually kind of uh, has a cyclic structure and it's a trace. So now you just have some 
strings of letters like this. Of course, <laughs> well, at this point, it's probably not clear why this is a good idea. But I first give you uh, the reason why it is a good idea and explain more in detail later uh, why, uh, what I mean by the advantages. So there are actually two advantages. One is because, so one uh, is actually related to the previous two lectures. So if you have a trace, then as I explained in the previous lecture, it corresponds to periodic spin chain, the finite size spin chain. Now, the, I'm considering the infinitely long spin chain and forgetting about the trace. So it's, it basically corresponds to the spin chain, which is infinitely long, and, and you, are basic, you can basically forgetting about the kind of periodic boundary condition. And so now spin chain is infinite, which means you can actually define asymptotic states on the spin chain. And also, there is a well-defined notion of the S-matrix on the spin chain. So remember, the S-matrix is not well-defined if you are considering working in a compactified space, and you really need to go to the kind of infinitely, uh, infinitely large space in order to define the S-matrix, because the S-matrix requires the existence of the asymptotic states. So now you, you can describe everything up in terms of S-matrix state, S-matrix. So why this is a good idea? And it is a good idea because if you are in a finite size system, then the typical way to describe the, the evolution, of the evolution of this system is to look at the time evolution using the Hamiltonian. But if you go to higher loops, then the well, Hamiltonian gets very complicated and it becomes super complex. Uh, well, it's actually really hard to follow what happens dynamically. But if you go to infinitely long spin chain, then you can talk about the S-matrix. And S-matrix basically only depends on the asymptotic data. And the asymptotic data are, of course, given by asymptotic states, which uh, behave like free particles. So in this way, you can, uh, it is actually easier to impose the symmetry and see the uh, outcome of the uh, symmetry constraints because you don't really, well, you can basically treat the complicated interaction in the middle as some, something like a black box. And there is another advantage, uh, which is uh, related to the, one of the keywords today. So that is large gauge transformation. So, okay, for this I will explain a bit more in detail. But the idea is that if you consider a very long, well, infinitely long system, you can consider the gauge transformation, which does not die off at infinity, and those transformation becomes a part of the symmetry. So the key point is that if you consider infinitely, infinitely, well, infinitely large system, especially, and especially if the system is, has a gauge invariance, you sometimes enhance the symmetry because you get another symmetry coming from the large gauge transformation. So, so let me expand the second point. Okay, so section two is large gauge, large gauge, large gauge symmetry transformation and center extension. So to explain what I really mean by this last sentence, that the large gauge transformation becomes a part of the symmetry, uh, I need to remind you a little bit about the supersymmetry transformation law in n equals 4 C prime new theory. So, as I said many times, 
n equals 4 supermean theory has supersymmetry. And if you act the supersymmetry to bosons, OK, you know you get some fermion. OK, I'm forgetting all the indices. I'm be being a bit sloppy. OK, but it's, it's, yeah, okay, it's actually, if, you, if I write it a bit more precisely, I get something like this. So you have gamma matrix and then psi. But I'm still not writing any, any of the indices, so it doesn't mean much. But I don't really need it, actually. So the boson becomes fermion. And fermion becomes, of course, boson. But typically, uh, this becomes something like d phi, covariant derivative of d phi. And you some also get some uh, uh, field strengths. And, well, it, and in the case of n equals 4 super if you look at the structure carefully, then you also discover that uh, there is also a term which looks like this. So 1 over 2g. Uh, phi i, phi j, gamma i j, epsilon. So there is a term which is given by the commutator of two scalars. And let me point out one thing. So because, well, first, well, actually two things. First, this is essentially, this part is essentially uh, you can view it as a kind of field-dependent gauge transformation. And in addition, because it's coming from the gauge transformation, uh, this comes with the gauge coupling constant. So remember, all the fields in n equals 4 super mu theory are adjoints. So the gauge transformation acts in this commutator form. So you can view this commutator as some kind of gauge field-dependent gauge transformation where the uh, gauge parameter is phi i. OK. All right, so if you combine these two transformation laws, then it means that if you act uh, twice the supersymmetry transformation law to fermions, then typically you get something like g times phi times psi. So you recover the original fermion, but now uh, it's given by the well, well it, it, it's given by the commutator with phi. And now it's it's more. I think it's probably more clear why I wanted to call it field-dependent gauge transmission. Now, now I still have phi, the same psi, but. It's given by the commutator, and if you view this as a gauge parameter, then you, this really becomes the gauge, field dependent gauge transformation. OK. <clears throat> so, this is a kind of general structure of the supersymmetry transformation law in n equals 4 super mu theory. And in particular, if you consider OK, if you consider the supersymmetry transformation law inside, we, uh, sorry, if you consider supersymmetry, which belongs to the little group I just described, then something interesting happens. Let me, okay, I'm not sure what is a good strategy. Is there any question? OK. So yeah, maybe I can start writing. So in particular, if you choose Q supersymmetry inside PSU2 slash 2 square, then uh, roughly speaking, if you 
Okay, so let's choose two supersymmetry, Q and Q prime. And if you act it uh, on the uh, field chi, sorry, sorry, on the, let's, how, how to write it? Well, okay, on some of the, some field M, so this is a field in N equals four supermissary. Well, it can be boson or fermion. And then what you get is actually G times Z M. And so what I wanted to point out is that in this particular case, the scalar which appears here is really Z, where Z is the uh, field which we used to construct the vacuum of the spin chain. So maybe it's not still clear why this is interesting or why this is useful, but let me explain why this is useful. So let, in order to do that, let me uh, write this field-dependent gauge transformation in this way. So P is a kind of generator which uh, uh, <clears throat> generator of this field-dependent transformation. So this is actually very interesting. And first of all, I should point out, so there are two points. So the first of all, I should point out P acts trivially on gauge invariant observables. And this is actually easy to see. So if you have single trace operator, so I don't know, X, Z, sorry, well, like this, then if you act P, then essentially what you need to do is to, const so this P acts all the fields inside the trace, so essentially you need to sum over all possible uh, uh, commutator, all possible action of the commutator, but this is clearly zero if you use the cyclicity of the trace. So maybe I should consider like a, just a two length operator. So let's consider so x and y. So then it becomes really more, it becomes clearer. So if I act, it, act p on this guy, then what I get is trace of z and x and y plus trace of x and z and y, and which is clearly zero if you expand the commutator. But now, P actually acts quite non-trivially for the infinitely long chain for infinitely long chain, I just described there because I said I'm going to forget about the trace. So if you forget about the trace, P can act very non-trivially. So let's see what is the consequence of that. So let's consider uh, the action of P. Okay, I should wait a bit. <clears throat> 
So let's consider the action of P on this like a one magnon state. So plane wave like one magnon state. So now I have infinitely long chain. So okay, so I shouldn't put the put it like this. So so I have infinite okay, so long chain. And then uh, this is inserted at n's position. So let's consider the action of P on this uh, plane wave state with one magnon. Then, uh, so as I said, uh, P basically acts all the fields inside the trace. But of course, if, you, if it acts on Z, then it just gives you zero because it's the commutator between Z and Z. So the only non-vanishing non piece is the one which comes from the action on this X field here. And if you expand it, of course, what you get is very simple. So you have Z, Z, chi, Z, minus Z, Z, chi, Z, Z. And the point here is that is originally, this was inserted at the nth position. But now, because I in, in, inserted extra z, so this becomes, this is at now at n plus 1 position. Whereas in this case, this is still n's position. And so we can actually rewrite this in such a way that, OK, because we, I'm summing over n equals 1 to infinity because it's infinitely long operator, I can actually rewrite this so that I only have something like this uh, on this side. So essentially, I just need to shift n for the first term. And the result is given as follows. The result is e to minus ip minus 1 n So, and now chi is only at n, n's position. Okay, I was actually forgetting the important piece, which is the complete constant dependence. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, you're talking about the fact that I changed the length, right? But th this is also the reason why I wanted to consider infinitely long operator. So infinite plus one is infinite. So, but but it's actually important. So, okay. So maybe let's. Uh, okay. So, what is a good way? So let's. It's actually important to keep track of the fact that you increase the length. But in this discussion, you can basically forget about it. Okay, so yeah, I'm. <laughs> right. Uh, okay, so now I'm. Well, I'm choosing some convention in which uh, the side, well, the side number starts from one to infinity. So there is a. It's actually semi-infinite chain. Yeah. Okay, so. And, okay, so I need to make one remark about this. So if you look at the structure, then you discover that uh, the part which I wrote here is exactly the same as the original state. So in a sense, the original state is an eigenstate of P. And the eigen, if you look at the eigenvalue, then you probably notice that this is nothing but a discrete transformation, translation. So remember, this state has a definite momentum. So you can actually view this e to minus ip as the action of the e to minus ip. Uh, OK, so there are too many p's, actually. That's small p. 
hat, where small p hat is a kind of translation generator. So this, uh, if you view it in this way, then you can see that this is a discrete translation. Now, so that's all for p hat over there. And, and I said that this p hat basically comes from q squared. And the same is actually true for S squared. And what happens is that uh, if, you consider the, if you consider the action of two uh, superconformal generator on, this, on some field, uh, at classical level, of course, uh, there is nothing strange happens. But if you go to one, well, if you go to higher loop, for example, well, two loops, and and if you carefully studied how the superconformal transformation law is modified by the loop effect, then you discover that this is again gives rise to gives rise to some similar uh, field dependent gauge transformation. But now instead of z, I have z inverse instead of z. And I can apply the same argument. So let's call this transformation k hat. And I should emphasize that because it's a gauge transformation, it, all, it comes with the gauge coupling constant. And now I can apply the same argument for the, this k hat. Then, in the end, so this is a kind of homework exercise, but uh, you discovered, again, something similar. So again, k is also discrete translation. And has an eigenvalue, g times e i t minus one. So, so the argument I just gave is a bit heuristic, but uh, inspired from this kind of argument, in 2006, uh, Niklas Beisert came up with uh, an algebra, algebraic structure which basically unifies the little group I described in the beginning of my lecture and these extra generators. And that structure, was, that group is called a centrally extended BSU 2 slash 2 squared. So, so you can actually combine everything into one algebra. And well, algebra is essentially almost the same as usual PSU2 slash 2 squared. But the main difference is that, as I said, if you consider uh, two Qs or Q squared, or more precisely, if you consider the anti-commutator of Q, or in the original PSU2 slash 2, it, is, it was actually 0. But now I have P hat. By the way, this was, this was a generator for the left PSU2 slash 2, but it's also true for the right PSU2 slash 2 generator. And similarly, uh, I have this structure, I have, so the anti-commutator of superconformal translation gives you k hat. And of course it's the same. Also for the left PSU to slash two. And, and also, uh, if you, there is some, something happens if you consider the anti-commutator in Q and P so this, is, this has not, well, these two are actually related to the gate transformation, but the last one is not related to the 
uh, gate transformation, but it just comes from, it actually comes from the original uh, super conformal group. But in addition to all these generator, which is, con which is in the non-centrally extended PSU2 slash 2, you have additional generator, which is the dilatation minus J, where J is the U1 generator and D is the dilatation generator. And essentially, this D minus J combination gives you the uh, anomalous dimension. So this is the same as spin chain Hamiltonian I discussed in the previous lecture. So this is the structure of PSU2 slash 2 squared. And And let me emphasize that uh, <clears throat> okay, so 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 this is the structure of PSU two slash two centrally extend PSU two slash square. And uh, as I wrote over there, uh, P and K are okay, so if you consider uh, one magnon plane wave state, uh, they are actually the eigenstate of PSU, sorry, eigenstate of P hat and K hat, and the eigenvalue is again given by. So if you consider some momentum eigenstate of one magnon state, then P hat is minus one. So, okay, so there are actually a bunch of Zs, which I didn't write. And <clears throat> So as you pointed out, I inserted extra z, so let's keep it. So this gives you this structure. And k hat acted on one magnon state with momentum p is given by this structure. So it's, so what I mean by z inverse is you basically just kind of decrease the length of the operator. Okay, so let's see. So these are the action of the generators. And uh, let's see. Okay, so let me also write the action of D minus J on this. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah. Sorry, I shouldn't do that. I think. So now, what we know is that uh, each magnon insertion or each uh, field insertion uh, belongs to the bifundamental representation of original PSU two slash two. And furthermore, if you consider insertion with definite momentum. It's also an eigenvalue, eigenstate of p hat and k hat, which are essentially the central extension of the algebra. And now I can use the representation theory of centrally extended PSU2 slash 2 squared to see, uh, for example, what is the value of, uh, the, what is the eigenvalue of d minus j, for example, for example. So that's what I was going to write. And to write down the eigenvalue of d minus j, it's actually uh, convenient to introduce the analog of the rapidity variable. And in this case, the rapidity variable takes this form. So instead of p, I would use the variable u, where variable u uh, is related. So, so this is a function of x of u, and x of u is inverse of this relation. And furthermore, f plus minus u means f of u plus minus i over two. So it is clear. So it's a bit, it's a bit confu confusing notation, I think. But I, well, by the way, I can also invert this relation. So if I invert it, okay, let's see if I can invert it. So x of u 
equal to g over u plus square root of u squared minus 4g squared. And OK, in this form, I think it, what I mean by this is probably much clearer. So I have this function, and I just need to shift the argument. So this is just one way of parameterizing the momentum. And if I use this u, then the eigen up value of d minus j can be determined from the representation theory of centrally extended PSU to slash 2 squared. And the result is as follows. So the result is 1 plus 1 over x plus of u, x minus of u, over 1 minus 1 over x plus of u, x minus of u. OK. So now I just described all the symmetry which governs this system. And in particular, what is nice about the central extension, which comes from the gauge transformation, is that the eigenvalue, OK, it's probably hard to see now, but the eigenvalue actually depends on the coupling constant. And and the next thing we need to do is to impose this symmetry on the S matrix on the spin chain. So what I need to do now is uh, require that S matrix on the spin chain must commute with the symmetry where H is centrally extended. So this is the analog. Well, we also did that for ON model. But in the ON model, it was kind of simple because if you have like four fundamental indices, like there are like only three structures that you can write. Uh, <clears throat> and essentially, I'm going to do that for this more complicated group. And the result is actually very surprising. So the result is, if you require this condition, then there is only one, one unfixed number, which is actually overall, num overall coefficient, and the rest is completely determined. So OK, so I should emphasize that now I'm considering 2 to 2 s matrix, as in the case of ON model. So, and I said each insertion or each magnum is bifundamental. So each magnum carries two indices, which means that this S I wrote there here is, has two indices coming in and two indices coming out. And the index structure is completely determined by the symmetry group. And what is left undetermined is just this part. And OK, I ran out of time, so I cannot explain how to uh, fix this part. But maybe I can explain a little bit in the next lecture. But as in the case of ON model, you can actually uh, constrain this by imposing cross uh, symmetry and unitarity. And once you do that, you can basically fix everything. So, so I should emphasize that here, I'm not even using the yang baxter equation. So just imposing the symmetry, I can completely determine the structure of this S matrix. So let's write it in this way, because it's kind of important S matrix, and also, well, yeah, also, yeah, Nicholas made a lot of money from this S matrix. <laughs> well, I hope he doesn't watch this. Okay. <laughs> and once you determine the S matrix of this 2 2 2 scattering, uh, we can then do the same thing as we did in the lecture two. So, what I mean by this is that you can write down the beta equation as the periodicity 
condition. So once you have this, then I can assume the integrability and, well, assume that multi-particle scattering factorizes, and then uh, write something like this. PK, PJ equals one. And of course I should, sorry, of course I should put it to the line here. So then I can write down this equation. So this is Bete Ansatz equation, and this gives you constraints on the momentum. And once you understand the momentum, then uh, I can compute uh, the energy, which is the anomalous steam engine, as a sum of energy of individual magnons. And this energy is actually nothing but the one I wrote over there as the eigenvalue of the D minus J generator. So in this way, you can completely determine the S matrix of PSU 2 slash 2 square, or well, N equals 4 sub mu theory, and then gain some, inf well, compute some, inf uh, some, some of the spectrum of N equals 4 sub mu theory exactly at finite coupling. So in the next lecture, uh, I will probably explain a little bit more about the S matrix, and afterwards, I'm going to explain how this kind of idea can be used for more complicated observables like three-point functions. Thank you very much. Any questions? We have time to one fast question, please. Okay, we'll continue the discussion then. Let's go for a coffee break and thanks so short again. <laughs>